So, yeah, this is the landing page for the Myth TV webpage, mythtv.org. Um, there's a lot of information on here, but the trouble is a lot of it is out of date, and you'll see warnings at the tops of lots of pages saying this web page is out of date or it only covers up to version, uh, you know, 25 or something like that. So it's a bit unfortunate, but there is a lot of information to read. Um, there is a user manual for setting up Myth TV. I'm not sure if it specifies here about compiling it from source, which is what we'll be doing. It's more to do with the hardware part of it. Um, in fact, the looks like the only part to do with the software is the first part which specifies how Myth TV works. There's basically two parts to it. There's a back end and a front end. Um, the back end is the bit that's got the brains. It, it manages the tuners, it manages the programming, the recording, etc. And then the front end is the bit that displays all the recordings and where you can access um, the viewings or control the programs you want to record and so on and normally they would reside reside on the same pc and that's the way i'm going to be building it in these videos there's an advanced way of um, setting myth tv up we have um, a very simple machine with the tuners in and the back end running on it and then you have other remote machines which are the front ends and they're a little bit more powerful because they're the ones that are going to decode the stream um, and they communicate with the back end over a network. So there's basically two ways. In fact, there's a, a third way there. It's, it's mentioning about a back end, a slave back end, and a front end. So I'm not going to go into that. It says here about the CPU requirements for the back end and front end. Let's just have a quick look at that. Okay, so they're actually saying that a, a CPU pass mark of 500 or more for the back end or the front end should be sufficient. Um, and it says here that that will be sufficient to record six HD channels. So you can see the requirements aren't aren't very large when you're looking at modern pro processors that have got pass mark values of ten thousand or more. You can see that um, quite a uh, an old or uh, lowly CPU will be fine. I mean, the first machine I had was on a Pentium four. Uh, two and, I think it was about two and a half gigahertz Pentium 4 um, and that was back in the mid 2000s um, and then I've upgraded it gradually over time just on second hand machines actually just cheap machines that I've bought um, it's currently on the, I bought a brand new machine for the one I use about five years ago and it was an i3 6th generation I think it was um, and that's fine. It's it still works fine on there. So um, I don't, I'm not sure what pass mark value that is, but it's you know it's more than enough. Uh, memory, yeah, it says one to two gig of RAM. The machine I use it on has got four gig. Um, I think I have used it in less than that, but yeah, obviously the more you can throw at it, the better. You don't want too much, obviously, because the machine's going to be on all the time. Um, and more RAM means more electric, so 4 gigs probably a good balance, I would say. You don't really want to go for the minimum. And as, as I say, remember these instructions or this, this information is usually out of date, um, so you might want to go a little bit more than what's recommended here. Uh, yeah, hard disk, you will need lots of space. I think I'm currently using 6 terabytes of space just for recordings that I haven't watched stuff that gets recorded and I'm thinking well do I really want to watch it or not um, especially HD recordings um, an HD for an hour is probably uh, well yes as it says there 3 to 8 gigabytes an hour that's probably very accurate actually from what I've seen it obviously depends on um, the data rate that the broadcaster is broadcasting at um, but yeah these are probably pre pre pretty accurate from what, what I've seen also, as it says, right into video to disc is sensitive to timing issues. So you don't want a slow disc. Um, you don't want one that's going to stop to do some checks or, you know, hasn't got a fast throughput because it's, you know, got so much stuff to write to it, can't accept anymore. So you want something reasonably fast. Uh, file systems, I've always used the EXT, um, EXT3 originally back in the early 2000s 
or mid 2000s. Uh, but now EXT4, and I've never had any problems with them. I've considered using ZFS, but I don't think ZFS would be a good idea. Um, it's uh, quite write intensive, um, so I'm not sure that would be good. And in any case, uh, you know, recordings, if it's something you want to keep, you can archive them and take them off the machine anyway if you want to put them onto another file system is a bit more durable. Um, from what I've read about these two file systems, they, they would seem to be good options, but of course, the uh, thing I will always like to think about is that if there's a problem with the machine, you need to recover stuff. Have you got the tools that can read these file systems? So you've got to think about compatibility issues. They're not, not as popular as ext 4 is within the Linux world. So something to think about. Uh, connections, you obviously need power. You need the... Um, broadcast input whether that's satellite uh, terrestrial or I believe there are cable cards for cable TV um, I've never had cable TV so I can't comment on the success of that but I've used Mr. TV with um, satellite and terrestrial TV and works fine with both um, graphics cards again you probably need something reasonably new um, if you can get an accelerated one, for example, I mentioned NVIDIA with VD Power, uh, that that will help with the display of the picture and makes it a lot more um, pleasing to watch because it's, it's not so jumpy, it's more fluid, uh, the image. <clears throat> um, outputs, well, um, if you do plug this into a TV, probably nearly all modern TVs have got some sort of um, digital output these days that's compatible with... Um, a PC. Obviously, if you're going for an older PC, then you have got to consider what, what outputs that's got um, into the TV. Um, but I've used VGA originally. That worked fine, although it was hard to get a decent enough resolution. Um, although, when I first started using this TV, there was only standard definition broadcasts. And I think the VGA, the highest I could get the resolution was um, to something like 1300 by 900 or 600, something like that. Um, but as I say, with standard definition, that wasn't a problem. It was just the fact that the TV could do full HD. I was trying to get the resolution as high as possible, but um, maybe it's a limitation of VGA that it can't go as high as that. Uh, that's possible. Um, but DVI, um, a DVI to an HDMI converter works fine. I've used that in the past. Um, and currently, the machine I've got is just an HDMI to HDMI. The sound does go over the HDMI, so if that's important, if you don't want to use separate sound, um, make sure that the HDMI is compatible with that, the HDMI input and the lead and so on. Um, I've never used S-Video, um, any of these connectors, so I can't comment on success of them, but I can't imagine they're much different from um, using composite or VGA, and similar type of analog connections. Um, audio, out, as I said, I'm currently using HDMI. In the past with the VGA, it was a separate analog um, connection because obviously VGA doesn't have any form of um, audio uh, connector on it. So that was just a simple 3.5mm jack plug uh, to connect the PC out, uh, card, sound card output to the um, TV. Then video sources, something you have to consider carefully. What what have you got available in your area? Well, where, where I live at the moment, there is terrestrial, but it's uh, quite a weak signal. Um, so I use satellite instead. Uh, not quite the same channels as the terrestrial. Um, and there are some missing as well that are on terrestrial. But conversely, there are other channels on the satellite that don't get on the terrestrial. So it's a bit like six of one and half a dozen of the other. Um, so if you want terrestrial, you have to look for a card that supports DVB-T, T for terrestrial. And as it says here, so it does mention DVB-C, which is for cable. As I say, I've got no experience with that, so I can't uh, comment on that. Um, DVB-T is SD, standard definition terrestrial. T2 is high definition terrestrial. And then likewise, DVB-S is for satellite. Um, again, S is for the standard definition, standard definition satellite, S2 for high definition satellite, 
and it mentions roughly what regions in the world that you'll get these different standards and what you should be looking for. So I'm in UK, which is obviously in Europe. So um, I believe we have, well, yes, we do have a cable carrier that I know of. and There used to be a few other smaller ones. So any of these would suffice for anybody in the UK, um, assuming you've got access to cable or uh, everybody will have access to satellite if they have a dish. And ne- nearly everybody would a- have access to terrestrial. Obviously, if it's in a different region, you'd have to work out what you need um, in terms of the interface car to capture the TV signals. Um, there's something here about encoding cards. Um, I've never used anything like that. So, um, all these analog frame grabbers, yeah. If you stick to these tuner cards, then you can't go wrong. There's there's no problem getting things working. One thing you want to avoid is you don't want to buy a capture card. You want a tuner card, a digital tuner card, not a digital capture card. Reason the difference is that a capture card will just capture video frames, but you want a card that's actually got a tuner in it, a bit like your TV has or your um, satellite recorder box, your set top box has got. Um, because you'll be plugging the aerial, either the satellite aerial or the um, terrestrial aerial or the cable into the PC, into this car, which will be plugged into the PC. Um, so there's some other options here. I, I've not known what home run is for a long time. And I looked it up the other day and it did seem to be quite a good um, thing. So something I might look into in the future is basically... Uh, sending TV singles over a network, which seemed quite good. If you've got multiple TVs in the house, that might be something to look into, but I'm, I'm not going to be mentioning any more about that. Um, as I said, Myth TV is quite complex setting it up, um, and especially setting up from scratch as uh, we're going to be doing it. Uh, incidentally, there used to be two Linux distributions which specialised in Myth TV as uh, sort of turnkey solutions, um, even working from a live CD stroke DVD. Um, I think the one was called Mythdora, which was based based on Fedora. Um, that lasted a few years. Um, another one was called Mythbuntu, which lasted for quite a number of years, probably about five or six years, I guess. Um, and I nearly switched to that, but then I found out that support was, uh, you know, it was not going to be uh, supported anymore. So. Um, yeah, basically the, the distribution I've stuck with is Gen 2. Um, and in fact, I've not updated the machine I'm using for about 10 years because at one time there was no support for Myth TV with Gen 2. It was uh, it didn't have a maintainer. Uh, there was no new versions being supported within Gen 2. And as I say, it's quite a complex thing to upgrade and update. So I've, I've basically just stuck with the same version I've had for about 12 years now. Um, not, not had it updated. Uh, it's something I'm thinking about updating, but I've got so used to all the little quirks and idiosyncrasies of the current version, I'm sort of quite happy leaving it. And it did make me think about something in that, and this is the reason why I've decided to um, show Myth TV on Linux from scratch, is that Linux from scratch is not really designed to be updated. Um, by default, it's got no packaging facilities um, what I found was with Gen 2 is I ke- used to keep it up to date before the Myth TV support dropped temporarily. Um, and it would cause problems in that either the compiles were taking too long or there'll be some problem with the update that it took time to fix and therefore the um, PC was offline and I was missing recordings or I couldn't watch TV, for example. So I started to come to the conclusion, you know, do you really want a system that gets updated regularly? And I've thought about Debian, but Debian doesn't support it natively, and that, that would need some work. And I thought, well, maybe Linux from scratch would be the ideal operating system. It's small. Um, from the completion of Linux from scratch, you'd get a basic system that you really can't do much with unless you're into learning the basic tools within a Linux system. Um and it's hard to update. So, again, that would mean that you really, wouldn't really want to update anything anyway. You, basically, like a set-top box, you might just go buy a set-top box and you're stuck with that software that comes on there. Yes, you might get a few software updates, which are probably security updates, but it's probably a similar 
similar idea to that that you basically buy whatever or you get whatever you buy at the time so in a similar way i thought well install whatever linux from scratch is at the time install myth tv and you know just keep that running as it is until you decide to you know maybe maybe uplift the whole lot in one go um the way i'm going to show you how to install myth tv i kind of do do it the linux from scratch way and put it in the opt directory the optional directory so that it can be updated but it would probably entail other packages to be updated as well so as i say that's not the prime thing it's to get it up and running and have a working system that can work 24 hours a day um, another thing with getting it working 24 hours a day at one time i did have um, two identical tuners in two identical machines Again, let's like say these were second-hand machines I'd bought for you know fifty pound or something, um, and I used to do the updates on one. And assuming it had gone all right, I did the update on the live box. So that's one way of coping with updates. If you do decide to do any updates, is to do a, a dry run on a, another machine as identical as possible, um, so that you know exactly how it's going to go when you come to do the live one. A bit like you'd probably do an in industry. Really, you'd have you know, live machines and you'd have like test machines that you, you do your dummy runs on. So, um, yeah, there's some more information there about physical installation, how you put it all together and so on. Um, Ethernet, Ethernet's a good idea if you want to access the box remotely. There are a couple of tools you can use to um, either back up the database or access uh, to see what programs are due to record and so on. Um, keyboards, yeah, I use a key, keyboard of mine. Um, I think it's specifically used for media. It's got a, a mouse pad on it with a couple of buttons. Um, it hasn't got a number pad on it, uh, and it also lights up as well, so you can see it in the dark. So that's something to consider. I've, I have used a remote control in the past, but because it's connected to a PC, and you can type stuff in on the PC, um, either through maintenance or restarting it or... Um, even changing descriptions or rules to the programs uh, is probably easier to have a keyboard, so that's something to think about. Uh, infrared remote control, there is a facility in Linux to um, control uh, infrared devices with this subsystem called Lurk, Linux Infrared Control. As I say, I just use a keyboard, which is a USB-based keyboard. It's a simple thing. The infrared was a little bit difficult to set up sometimes you find some of the buttons don't work and you have to go into the pain of modifying config files and remapping keys and so on so basically with the remote control you say like the play button might equate to the space bar on an ordinary keyboard you have to do things like that and make sure they all map to the correct buttons and things so it can be quite a pain although obviously uh, having a little remote control is much easier than having a keyboard at sort of 10 inches across or whatever 10 12 inches across but as I, say, I find the keyboard much easier to use overall despite its size <clears throat> um wi-fi remote but i think the box has got wi-fi but i've never used it i've just got it plugged into an ethernet port it's um far more convenient for me but obviously that's a personal preference and uh, some other options there for satellite and cable control um yeah, the, basically the card that I use, and I'll be showing you the satellite card that I'm currently using, there's nothing to do other than plug in the satellite cable in the back. There's no other boxes or anything like that that's needed to control it. Um, I presume it's saying that you can use an external satellite box and control that from Myth TV. I presume that's what this is about. Um, so that might be an option for the sound of it. Yeah, it mentions wireless key boxes here. Uh, keyboard, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I've said. It's nice to have it, and I've, I find it more convenient. So make sure your hardware is supported by Myth TV. So these links are all worth reading. Um, some, as I say, some of these links don't go anywhere. They're out of date. Uh, they're broken. Uh, but tuning cards, if you go to that, it'll come up with this page. And it's got a list of tuning cards, but as it says here, well, in fact, it says here, that Myth TV supports APIs, not capture devices. As I said before, it is a tuner card you want, not a capture card. 
So that's important to note when you're selecting your um, uh, card for picking up broadcasts. It also says incomplete um, list. It certainly is incomplete. It hasn't got um, an HD terrestrial card that I've used in the past and it hasn't got the current satellite card that I'm using and you know, I can guarantee it does work even though it's not on this list. So as it says, this list is not complete. So there's one there for ATSC standards and links to the Linux TV website. I suppose it would be good to look, click on there. You can get to the Linux TV website and have a look around. So you'd be in the right area for it. And there's one here for DVB with all different types of DVB. You can see they all do terrest excuse me, terrestrial TV, apart from the odd one or two. Uh, well, most of them do that. There's um, a few fewer, fewer that do satellite, but then in certainly in this country, in the UK, uh, terrestrial TV is far bigger than satellite. Um, and there's one there for Hong Kong, Macau, mainland China. But as I say, there's probably others. In fact, there's none listed for Japan and South America there, but there must be something. So if you click on any of these, it'll take you to the, to the uh, linuxtv.org website, which um, is probably the best place to look for cards. Although, again, I don't believe these are complete, these lists. Yeah, it says here that uh, may contain errors even. So you have to do your research when you're looking at uh, selecting a device. Make sure it's a it's compatible with the way you're receiving the broadcast, so i.e. I, is it cable, satellite or terrestrial. Uh, and B, if you want HD, that it supports the T2 or S2 um, uh, way of uh, broadcasting. Uh, I don't think there is a C2 for cable. I'm not sure whether that's already HD or not. I don't know. So I don't know anything about that. You want to check the, the profile of the card. Is it is it a full height, but you've only got a, um, a low profile box, which uh, is probably what you're going to be using if you want a nice compact box sitting under the TV. Um, and that's what all mine have been. So you have to make sure it's a low profile card. Um, the card I'm going to be showing you came, comes with a normal bracket and a low profile bracket and if it's got the normal bracket fitted it's normally only a case of undoing a couple of little nuts swapping over the bracket uh, to make the card into a low profile card it's it, the card's normally low profile it's just a bracket that matters um, and also have you got a spare slot is it a pci slot pcie slot you can get usb devices and so on um, so that's things to bear in mind. Um, so yeah, I can see I've looked at the terrestrial devices here. Let's go to the satellite devices to see if the card I've got uh, is listed. So I've got a PCIe device. So yeah, there's lots of warning here and it, uh, you know, what to look out for when you're selecting a card. So the one I use is not actually here. Um, the one I'm currently using is a TBS Technologies. One thing I can say, if you can, get hold of a card that is supported by the kernel because it's a lot easier to get working. You don't have to recompile um, third-party software uh, against the kernel to, to provide modules that can be loaded. Um, my original TV card was one of these... Hopeg or Hopage, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I know it's a bit of a weird pronunciation. And that was supported directly by the kernel, and it was really easy just to update the kernel. You know, that's all I had to do was update the kernel, and that was it, forget it. With these TBS Technologies ones, there's third party support, which is why it's in yellow here. And it is very good support. I uh, can't knock it at all, it always works. Um, but it is third party, which is a bit unfortunate. You've got to go to the manufacturer's website to download software and compile it and then compile it against the current kernel you got installed. So it does mean if you change the kernel, you've got to recompile the modules. Um, and that can take a, a quite a bit of time depending on the speed of your, your machine. So that's something to bear in mind. Although having said that, like I say, if you're planning on doing what I do is make a machine that's not going to be updated in any way or maybe just the security updates, then you're probably only going to maybe, you know, update this when you update the kernel possibly. 
Um, that would be it, really. So I'll go to the TBS Technologies website because I say that's the card I'm using. And um, I can recommend these. I, I don't get paid by them, but the fact that I've had, well, I've had two satellite S2 cards from them um, and used successfully. I've also had a, a terrestrial T2 card that's uh, worked fine from them. And the support's good. It's not like one of these companies where they support it one minute and then there's no support the next next minute, which you know has caught me out before with various devices. They they do actively support uh, Linux, which is the you know bugbear when companies decide they don't want to support Linux anymore. So yeah, they're, they're a good good company, and and the cards are reliable as well. They don't lock up, or you know I've never had any problems. My my machine under the TV can be on for. You know, weeks, months, even um, before you know, I might, I might reboot it, and that even then, that that's more down to the Myth TV software. Um, just needs maybe to be rebooted or something, or you've tuned to a channel that is not there, and it sort of locks up the machine or something, which can happen sometimes. Um, so yeah, they're they're very reliable. So if you just go to products, click on that, and then down here, you look for the type of tune you want. So got a PCI interface, I want a tuner, it's a TV tuner, and then you can see all the different uh, formats, the standards, so if you just want standard definition, terrestrial, oh sorry that's ISDB, uh, terrestrial T2 or cable, these cards here, there's these other DTMB cards, multi-standard cards, ATSC, um, but the satellite card I use at the moment is this 6902, a lot of these are equivalent. So this card has got two inputs. I believe this 6904 has got four inputs and you've got this one here with eight inputs and so on. So depending on how many uh, transponders your uh, satellite dish has got. So mine has actually got four, but I use the other two elsewhere. Um, but for the PC, the Myth TV PC, it's got two inputs. And in fact, I could... I have actually got two of these with two inputs. In theory, I could put them in the same machine and have a four-input Myth TV tuner so, or Myth TV device. So that's another way of doing it, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is the card I use, six, the TBS 6902. And you can see all the information here about it. That It's got the DVB-ST, DVB-S2, so it's the HD satellite and the standard definition, as it says there. Um and further stuff, you know, downloads the electronic program guide, which is what you want, so you can schedule recordings. Uh, Unicable, yeah, one cable compatible, so it sends the voltages down the wire to control the transponder. Um, it has actually got a power lead it comes with, but it's for a Molex connector, so if you've got a newer machine with uh, the SATA connectors, you might want to get an adapter to convert that to... Uh, the SATA to the Molex connector, which I think is what I've had to do. Uh, and even if it's a small desktop box, you might even need to get a splitter because they're normally quite short on extra power adapters, so it's something to bear in mind. And then there's all the sort of technical details about what signals it can receive and so on. So that's the hardware side of it. So as I say, that's the card that's currently in this machine. Um, and in fact, I did an LS PCI earlier on to view it. And you can see that that's it there. The device number is actually, the PCI device number has actually got the model number. I think, I'm pretty sure this changes depending on the model number, so that's a good indication of what you've got plugged in. But you'll notice I've used the K option on LSPCI to show the kernels, and you can see this is a, a Gen 2 live CD that I've booted. You can see that's got no knowledge of it because um, it needs third-party drivers to be installed to get it working. So there's, there isn't anything I can do with this at the moment to show it's connected correctly or that it's even working properly. 